Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2020 series of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. We thank you for attending this session, this time online due to coronavirus, but uh, we thank you for your support. The 2020 series, uh, lecture series is hosted by the Barbados Museum and Historical Society and the University of the West Indies Department of History and Philosophy. Tonight, we'll have a presentation done by Dr. Frederick Aline. He is currently a teacher of history and social studies at the Ellerslie School. And when he can, he does some uh, genealogical research too. He has published articles with Dr. Rocha about Barbadian migration to Brazil in the journal of the Barbados Museum in 2012, and also in an electronic journal in Portuguese at the University of the State of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Additionally, he also has contributed with articles on Barbadian descendants in Brazil and Guyana, uh, and he is uh, writing an upcoming biography. Currently, he's working to um, announce new academic projects and publications about the murder of Millicent Gittens, popularly referred to as Millie gone to Brazil. Tonight, Dr. Aline will talk uh, in his lecture, he will seek to highlight the Barbadian connection to Brazil from the, late in, from, from the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. Particular emphasis will be placed on the Barbadian contribution to the building of the Madeira Mamoré Railway from 1907 to 1912, and as workers in Belém in other areas of Brazil. Barbadians and their descendants as settlers in Brazil, assimilation, rejection, contributions to Brazil, and cultural retentions. The Barbadianos, the Barbadians today and beyond. So welcome, Dr. Aline. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Good evening to all of you out there. Um, it's a little different, and I understand why you're not here, so I thank you for being here with us this evening. Thank the museum for hosting, hosting this event, and of course, allowing us, myself, this opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. The Barbadian connection to Brazil is a long one, and as most of us know, the Barbadian, the Barbadian connection to Brazil started mainly back in the 1600s when Jews came from Brazil to Barbados. Uh, they were expelled from northern Brazil, and they were very instrumental in the development of the Barbadian sugar industry. But of course, and of course we have the lasting leg legacy of that presence in the Jewish synagogue in Bridgetown. But to the meat of our topic this evening, we look at the, that connection going in the, in the other direction, how Barbadians managed to be in Brazil, and how, what was their contribution in Brazil. Barbadians, from the research that I've seen so far, Mm. Barbadians were in Brazil from the late 19th century. And we know that from newspaper ads and other documents that the Barbadians there, somehow they got there through the British connection. And during that time, they were working for British employers in Brazil. And because of some problems they had with their employers, they had to be repatriated from Brazil. So they asked the British consulate to repatriate them. So they have that long presence in Brazil. In fact, this was at a time when Brazil had just ended its own uh, enslavement of, of, um, of its black population uh, around 1897 and Brazil emancipated its black population in 1888. So they were there rather early. 
Additionally, apparently Barbadians were, and we know Barbadians to be, in those days, to be great seafarers. A lot of them were working on merchant ships, moving around the globe. And some of them ended up in the Brazilian ports, and they settled. And from what Brazilian academics have, have noted, the, these Barbadians around the, the port city of Belém, they were singing this folk song, Shoe Fly, Don't Bother Me. And it has been recorded as a Barbadian folk song because of the Barbadians singing this song in Belém. This was an American folk song from the Civil War era, but it is credited to the Barbadians because they were singing it in Belém. The Barbadians were able to move fairly easily between Barbados and Brazil. And one of the reasons for this is that Barbados had this, because of its location, Barbados was on the route between North America and Brazil, and many ships would pass here. They would stop at the Bridgetown port to refuel or to reprovision. So Barbadians would be able to get on these ships, move to Brazil, either as seamen and in some cases to seek employment. Of course, the, the main connection between Barbados and Brazil began in the early 20th century when Barbados started to move to Brazil in seek of work. This was a time when Barbadians were moving all over the place, to Panama, to Brazil, to Guyana, other parts of the Caribbean. Some were even moving in the period before back to Africa. But importantly, the move to Brazil came about because Barbadians needed work for the period, the late 19th century to the early 20th century, there was significant suffering in Barbados. High levels of poverty, the health situation was bad, housing was bad, and people needed an outlet for, to be able to earn something for them and the families. And the Panama Canal came along very early in the century, the construction of the canal came along. And very soon after was also the Madeira Mamare Railway. And like the, the, the sugarcane boom in the Caribbean, Brazil had its rubber boom. This was the time when Brazil was producing significant amounts of natural rubber. And this rubber was being used all over the world. So in order to export this rubber, the Madeira Mamaria Railway was built. The reasons for building it was that Brazil and Bolivia, they had a dispute over a region in the far west of Brazil, along the border between Brazil and, and Colombia, by the name of Acre. This area was seized by Brazil, and in return, Brazil agreed to build a railway system that would allow Bolivia to export its rubber. The area of the Madeira River, they, had significant, they have significant rapids. So the railway system stretches from the Bolivian border around these rapids to the more navigable portions of the Madeira River. And they needed a workforce to assist and building of the railway. Persons came from all parts of the world to work on the, on the railway. Like the Panama Canal, the Madeira Mamaria Railway, it had more than one, there were more than one attempt to build the railway. So the Barbadians basically were there about, this is about the third attempt, and Barbadians had some idea about what was happening in Brazil. 
the, on the second attempt to construct the railway, the ship that was taking persons, laborers, and supplies from the United States passed through Barbados. And they spent a day here. Um, the crew got off, and they had a grand time in, in Bridgetown. And then they moved on to Brazil. Another ship came five months later, and again, they spent some time in Barbados and, and moved on. Bridgetown was a very important seaport. It was a busy seaport, and of course, Barbadians were well aware of what was happening in other parts of the world. So they took the opportunity to go to Brazil to work, like they went to, to Panama. The method of movement to, uh, to Brazil was similar to the general migratory movements and the, the, the methods were used in most of the migratory movements of Barbadians during the late 19th century, early 20th century. Thousands of Barbadians moved to Panama. We know of some of the names of some of these persons from the registers at the Barbados archives. We don't, the, the archives maybe only has about 6,000 names of Barbadians who moved to Brazil, who moved to Panama, but we know that there may be about 20,000 or more who went to work in Panama. In Maybe some persons say maybe 40. We, 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 we do not know because some of those persons left on their own. They did not register to go to Panama. Very much of the same thing happened in, for the migration to Brazil. And one of the reasons that has been proffered is that in those days, Barbadians had to give a reason for going, for migrating. And if they wanted to use the official means. And of course, to go to uh, the authorities in those days and explain that you wanted to go overseas. And then, as the law stated at the time, that you had to give a guarantee that your family wouldn't be dependent upon the, the, the government. Most could not, because poverty was extremely high. People were unemployed. A lot of them needed to get out of the country to help their families. So many of them decided that they would go on their own. And therefore, our registers do not give a full account of the persons who would have gone to many of these destinations. Guyana, the same thing. But they went, and we have, we, 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 we research also indicates that in addition to those persons who went and used the registered agents, we know of ship's captains who are moving through the Caribbean and taking people illegally. So there was this, this constant flow. In addition, as the earlier, as I with the earlier slide, in the newspapers at the time, you, 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 you got a good idea of the opportunities for our moving to Brazil. There were all these team ships moving through, the, through, through British Young. So it was very easy to, to get to, to Brazil. Additionally, Barbados had, there was the, the, the whole, I call it the, the whole network of, of, happenings within the country that allowed for the movement of information to allow people to know about what was happening. And the, just like what was happening in Panama, you had these concerns about people going to Brazil. Although I do believe that many of the concerns of the authorities at the time were more about keeping the laborers at home and maintaining the low wage rate that occurred in Barbados at the time, because Barbados at that time had one of, had about the lowest 
daily wage rate in the Caribbean. So Barbadians clearly could not be kept at home under those conditions. Now, the other, well, the other reasons that we don't see a lot of people in the registers. I have only found 83 people mentioned in the registers at the Barbados archives. Only 25 of those persons were Barbadians. The other persons came from the other islands, came to Bridgetown, registered with the agent to go to Brazil. So, but persons like late historian, Barbadian historian, Alexander Hoyos suggests that about 20,000 Barbadians made the trek to Brazil to work on the railway system. That, of course, does not correlate with what I found. But what I, in doing the research, what I was able to do was to look at the, look at the amount of mail that was being generated between Barbados and Brazil. And during the period when the, during the period when the Madeira Mamoreo Railroad was being constructed, something like, that was between, and the, the, the Barbados Post Office records that I was able to look at, they date from 1903 to 1916. But the period of the railway construction was from 1907 to 12. And we see in those records something like 145,375 pieces of mail going to Brazil. Now, clearly 25 persons from Barbados could not generate 145,000 pieces of mail in that period of time. And at the same time, we had 63,000 pieces coming back to Barbados. So clearly, a significant number of persons were in Brazil working on the railway. Brazilian academics looking at the records of the railway hospital and re the, the company's records, they estimate a third of the 20,000 people who worked on the railway were West Indians. So therefore, we, we know a significant number of the persons who were working on the railway site were Barbadians. And, but we do not have the names to, 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 to go with in the records. And as I said before, most people, most of the persons who were going to Brazil were leaving on their own. They did not take the chance of telling the authorities where they were going. Um, one of the important things is that there was a fairly serious campaign in the newspapers to discourage people from going to Brazil. And one report in the Agricultural Reporter um, in 1910 simply it says, uh, being sold into bondage and it, it, it spoke about all of the difficulties that these people would have, how many people were dying on, uh, while they were building the railway. Um, but this was nothing different than what was happening in Panama. The conditions were basically the same. You had the dense jungle, water, very waterlogged conditions, and of course you had the, the work-related accidents that would occur. So the conditions were basically the same. So but at that time, they were more in favor of persons going to Panama. Now, the other important factor to note with the Barbadian presence in Brazil during this early part of the 20th century, Barbarians were not only working on the railway. They were working in other parts of Brazil. They were working in Belém. They were working in Manaus. Recife, um, wherever they could find work. And many of them were, in some cases, some were, especially when they, they were working with 
the British who had a significant financial interest in Brazil at the time, many of them worked for British and Americans who, expatriates who were in Brazil. And they were as teachers. A lot of them worked around the docks in Belém. Um, you find communities of them there working in all areas. See, they, they, they had a presence in many places wherever they could find work. But Brazil was also going through a period of reconstruction, and especially in Belém. So there was ample work for them in, in, in Belém. The, a lot of them set up their own businesses. Um, there's a story of the Motley family, and in Belém, they had their own, what we call in Brazil, fresh fry business. And so they, they, they went to Brazil, and they, they, they used the entrepreneurial skills, and they, they, they established themselves in Brazilian society. But the main presence was in Portovelo with the railway. And one of the significant things after the railway was completed in 1912 was that some of those Barbadians decided that they would settle in Brazil. And many of them got jobs with the railway when it was nationalized by, by the, the Brazilian government. Many of them were already working with the railway in significant positions because when they got to when they went to Brazil, the Brazilian the the contractors who were English and American, they were very favorable favorable to the Barbadian workers they understood that the Barbadian workers had some experience in construction and they appraised the, the education and the skills of the Barbadian workers. So what they did, the construct contractors, they allowed the Barbadian workers to work on the main construction site of the railway. And this main construction site, they allowed the Barbadians to build their, ho their homes and they did all of the buildings for, for the contractors. When the Barbadians built their homes, they built shadow houses. And it is by building these shadow houses, they transferred the shadow house style to that part of Brazil. So you can still see some shadow houses in Portobello. The town that, and now a city, that became Portobello, originally, the settlement that was the Barbadian compound became a little village, and it was called Goat Hill, Al, 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 in Portuguese, Alto de Bode. And there are many reasons that were given for the naming of that area, um, Goat Hill. Um, some suggest, some academics suggest that it was racist. Uh, but the Barbadians stood out. They were educated con as when you compare them to, 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 to the black per, um, people in Brazil. Um, they, they spoke English, so they stood out. And it is suggested that maybe the Brazilians in the area, when they heard them speak English, they, they said they sounded like goats. Others suggest that it meant that they smelt like goats. But we, should also, we can also look at it within the context of Brazilian society, where we know we, that uh, black Brazilians are at the bottom of the top, totem pole in, in Brazilian society. So, but descendants of the Barbadians themselves, have, they have said that they considered it to be racist. The, the tongue that developed became, as I said, became Portovello. That tongue was also called Barbados tongue. And when I first started this research and I googled Portovello, you would see Barbados tongue also come uh, appear on the screen as one of the names of Portovello. But this came about because of the number of Barbadians who were among the West Indian group who were there. And 
they were Grenadians, Trinidadians, Jamaicans, but the Barbadians were a dominant group. And as such, today you will, the, the, the community is called, they're called Barbadianos. Okay, all of them. But they established themselves and eventually Barbados Town became Portobello and the, the Barbadians set up schools for their children and for other English speakers in the area. And these English schools were very, very important in the community. And it is how they, they continue to, to maintain their culture. Stories are told of the Barbadians continuing to have this allegiance to the British crown. They would have photographs of the king and queen in their homes. They would always listen to the BBC. So they, they tried to maintain their Barbadian British culture. Of course, this all changed when the Brazilian government under Vargas, 1930s, 40s, decided that persons within the borders of Brazil had to speak Portuguese, they had to um, assimilate, and they had to become culturally Brazilian. So the English schools were closed. But for some Barbadians, they continued to speak English within their homes and to, and to practice Barbadian customs. Uh, in doing the research, I would have found that many of the early settlers, Barbadian settlers, they, they cooked Barbadian foods. They, they used bush tea. So they, they, they knew the Circe bush and all the other teas that, that we, we still, in some cases, use in Barbados. Cuckoo and um, things like sweet bread and sugar cakes were part of their uh, of, 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 of their culinary culture. Today, you can still find some families will do sugar cakes and sweet bread and they will fry their fish and season it the way we do it in Barbados. So some of those, those skills have been maintained. Most of the Barbados naturally were Anglicans and there was no Anglican church for them to go to. Brazil being a very is, is a predominantly Catholic society. But those in Portobello, they became Baptists, many of them, and, and they are still very prominent in the Baptist church in Portobello. During my last visit, the, the, the Baptist church was, um, was pastored by a, a, a holder, a very strong Barbadian name. The Barbadians in Belém were a little more fortunate in that there was an Anglican church in Belém by about 1910, um, the St. Maria's Anglican Church. And the Barbadians were able to go to the St. Maria Anglican Church in, in Brazil, in, in Belém. The one of the important aspects of the religious retention is that many of the younger persons are no longer going to the Anglican church. And as I spoke of earlier, Barbadians were forced to assimilate into Brazilian society. And one of the things many of the younger persons, the, the generation, the first generations began to do was that they started to learn Portuguese and to become Catholics. So just a few of the older members now go to the Anglican Church in, in, in Belém. But of course, they still maintain their strong Barbadian um, ties. Um, they speak fondly of Barbados. One of the, the major, uh, I call, retentions of, of, of the Barbadian in, in Brazil would be the surnames. 
you can still find a lot of the surnames among the Barbadian, among the Barbadian community. So, for instance, as you can see here with the slide, there is the Chase family. The Chase family, they are still known as, 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 the, as, as the Chases. Um, you will find Alleyne's, Greenwich's, um, just about any of the Barbadian names that you will find here. Some have been slightly changed to, to make them sound Portuguese. You can see where they try to make them, to, to, to kind of make it easier for them to assimilate where they, they, they change some of the names. So there will be a slight um, spelling difference, but you can identify the names in most cases. One of the more important, uh, more, more, more interesting um, members of the Barbadian community in, in Brazil uh, was someone who was very familiar to Barbadians, John Martineau. And uh, John Martineau, he was a part of the, the Portovello community in Brazil. And I was fortunate to be able to find where he had his business place. And he had a factory in Brazil, his, his soft drinks factory and ice factory there. And he established himself as a fairly substantial businessman in Portovello. But he could not, he complained of the the crime in, in, in Portovello and the lack of attention the police would give to the Barbadian community. So he eventually decided that he would move back to Barbados. And I, I suppose a lot of older Barbadians um, would remember his soft drinks. And um, so he had his first uh, adventure into that type of business in Brazil. We also have the various families here, the Davis family. And you have a number of family names, the Shocknesses. This is both Grenadian and a Barbadian family. The Johnson family, very, again, a very strong Barbadian name. And the Johnsons, as you can see from the slide, there have being able, I, this is at a, a little gathering, and at this gathering, you are seeing the Barbadian dishes, the, the sweet bread, and peas and rice. So this still, and this family has continued to speak English among themselves for well over 100 years. So they are, they are very strong they're very, they're very, they're, they have been very strong in maintaining their Barbadian connection. The Maloney de Pisa family, another important family in the Barbadian community in Brazil. Um, the Maloney de Pisa family originally from Sutherland Hill, St. Lucie, and they have made a significant contribution in, in Portovello as teachers, along with the Johnsons. They are all into education in, in, in Portobello and very well respected. One of the things that the Barbadian community in Brazil has continued to maintain is the tradition of education. Education has continued to be very, very important. So even though they were forced to close their English schools, many of the Barbadians still, they, they did very well when they went into the normal Brazilian school system. And a significant number of them have gone on to university level. They're working in, in, in the legal, legal profession. Some are, as I said, academics. You have urban planners. You have engineers. So the, the Barbini community has continued that education tradition in Brazil. Even even though at times, times it was difficult for them. 
as I, as I mentioned earlier, the, one of the more important aspects of the Barbadian uh, presence in, in Brazil has been the, the, the fact that the Chattel House was trans, transplanted to Brazil. And I'm just going to show you the slide of the Chattel Houses. The, the Barbadians were able to show the Brazilians how to build Chattel Houses. And This is Maloney de Pisa Ursula. And just before I show the shadow houses, Miss de Pisa, she was able to take the Olympic flame when they had the Olympics in Brazil a few years ago. She was given the honor of taking the Olympic flame. This is Mr. James Martineau and the Martineau family. Eventually, he brought his daughters back to Barbados. But the shadow houses, the shadow houses were Professor Sidney Greenfield, a United States academic, American academic. He first mentioned the shadow houses back in the 1970s, and the museum um, published an article about the shadow houses, the Barbadian shadow houses in Brazil. The Baptist Church in Portobello actually has a shadow house of its, of its own. And there is Mr. Holder. And this is a photograph of two shadow houses. The one on the left is in Portobello. The one on the right is in Barbados. And you can see there's no difference at all. Uh, this is a shadow house belonging to the Shockness family. And they still have this nice shadow house in their backyard. This shadow house is along what was once the old railway, Madeira Mamare railway line through Portobello. And to see the transition from Barbadian to Brazilian builders. This shadow house is not Barbadian owned. This is owned by a Brazilian. This one, this shadow house, is many miles from um, Porto Velo. Uh, Marco may be able to tell me how far um, for, this is right on the, Brazil, on the Bolivian border, this, this shuttle type house. And this is basically the end of the railway. And you only have to, have to cross the river to get to Bolivia. So you, 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 you had the, the, this very interesting um, transportation of the shuttle house style to, to, to Brazil. This is the old railway line as it passed through the tongue of Portovello. And after a few years, the, the rubber boom busted, so to speak, and the Madeira Mamara Railway came to a halt. And they have abandoned, they have these abandoned um, railway um, train engines around um, Portovello. What has happened now is that the, they have developed a museum about the railway in Portobello. And wherever you travel in Portobello, you will see the motifs on the walls of the city. Um, uh, in, in, in remembrance of the, of the Madeira Mamare Railway. And of course, the museum itself. And the Barbadians, in Portovello, the, the, the descendants of the, of the, of the settlers, original settlers and migrants, they are working very, very hard to preserve the 
legacy of the railway in Portobello, and they have been involved in many initiatives to make sure that the legacy of the Barbadian presence and the, the fantastic work that those Barbadian individuals did during that time is not forgotten. And they are working very hard at that. This is a slide of the St. Mar St. Mary's Anglican Church today in Belém. And this is an old photograph of the Barbadian community at church um, in, in, in Belém. And this, not a very good photograph, but this is of some of the members of the church today. This is in 2012. And you have persons like the Whites. Um, they are a very prominent family in, in the church, the Lifcott family. Um, these are names that we are very familiar with in Barbados. You will find those, those persons, those Barbadian descendants in the, in the church. Now, some of the Barbadian family names that we will find in the community are, as I mentioned, the Aliens, the Banfields, Blackmoon, Chase, Davis, Denny, the Pisa, Maloney, Johnson, Jones, the Julians. You have the Means, Scanterbury, Shockness, Skeet, Winter. And a very recent one I came across is Upton. Uh, we don't see that name in Barbados anymore, but we do know that there's a district in Barbados called Upton. So clearly this is an old Barbadian name. And of course, as I mentioned, many of the Barbadians in trying to assimilate, they have slightly changed some of their names. So you have, instead of Box Hill, you will find Box. Goodrich for Goodrich. Davy. It, possibly the word was a Davy family, but there's Davy and Davis. For sure, Orton and Olton. And instead of Arnold, Arnold. Um, squares has become secure. I hope I pronounce it properly. But these are the names that, some of the names that I have found. And the irony of all of this is that none of these names appear in the registers at the Barbados archives. None of these names. So I'm getting new names all the time, and none of these names are, are in the archives at all. Only the 25 or so that I, I found. So the Barbadian community in Brazil, the only thing that maybe like other places, has not happened, is that they did not play cricket. I have not found any evidence of the Barbadian community being involved in cricket. Maybe it was because the, after the, there was not that constant flow of migrants between Brazil and Barbados. But that is the one thing. They, I, I, I have found letters where they spoke of cricket and they remembered it, but no cricket was, that I have not found any evidence of cricket being played among the Barbadian community in Brazil. Um, the Barbadians, as I said, they, they continue to, to, to be connected to their Barbadian roots, and this is a 1984 photograph of the late Senator Wickham visiting the Barbadians in, in Portobello. And of course, the newspapers in Portobello continue to honor the Barbadians. As I said, the Barbadian community has been very active in making sure they are not a forgotten group. They are a very small group in terms of migration into Brazil. It can be compared to the Japanese or the Italians or the Spanish, but as a group, they have they continue to to do well. Um, one of the 
And at this time, when, while we are in this period of a, a type of a crisis, so to speak, the Barbadian community and one of the contributions in the one of the contributions that I especially am fond of speaking about is the contribution of the Dean family and um, Gladstone and Leo, Leonidas Dean. Leonidas Dean was, they were both doctors and their father migrated from Barbados from Bridgetown and these two of his sons, they became doctors. But Leonard, well, Leonidas Dean, he, he became a world famous doctor. And one of the important things that he, he, he was, as a young doctor, he was sent to the jungle, to the Amazon jungle, to look at what was causing Leishman's disease, which was plaguing a lot of people in the rural areas of Brazil. And he found that it was being passed to human beings by the bites of mites and sand flies. And his work as a parasitologist was had been recognized throughout the world. And Mr. Dean, Dr. Dean, one of the things that he 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 mentioned was that the the the, um, the diseases in the, in the world during the early 20th century, many of these diseases were moving because of the, the growth in transportation across the Atlantic. And um, it is something that we are realizing now as we go through this, this period with COVID-19, that the amount of travel and, and he recognized that back in the early, mid 20th century in his, in his own research. And he did much of the research in, in mosquito-borne diseases. So we have a lot to thank him for and a, a person of Barbadian heritage. Uh, one final mention in terms of the Barbadian community in, in Brazil would be the actress Claire Simons. She was one of the first black faces on Brazilian television. And her family name was Tate. And again, we know here in Barbados, the Tate family here is uh, a significant family in theater productions. And I don't know if there's a connection between the Tates here, that, that Tate branch of the family, but um, she's well remembered for being that one black face on Br Brazilian television in the 40s and 50s. That's about it. Thank you. I hope that you have learned a little bit about the Barbadians in Brazil. Any questions? We do have one question from online. Yes, please. And I believe this was posted by actually Marco. <laughs> <laughs> I think he didn't want to forget it um, okay. while you were speaking. Uh, Marco's question was to ask. Mm -hmm. He's very interested in knowing if the English, some of the Barbadian Brazilians still speak in Porto Velo, is similar to Beijing today. <laughs> and if, if it is or if it isn't, what are the significant differences that you may have noticed? What I notice about the Barbadians in Brazil, I was introduced to a member of the Shockness family on, on driving along the street and said, this is one of the Shockness. And when he spoke Portuguese, I think I detected <laughs> a Barbadian accent. That is what I noticed. I noticed that the accent, even though the language was Portuguese, and I, that was the first instance, but then in meeting other members of the, of the Barbadian community, I realized that it was this, this accent that seemed to be, seemed familiarly Barbadian. So I don't know if that is normal. 
The English, um, the Johnson spoke very good English, and some of the others, they knew a few English words, and, um, and the younger members of the family are making an effort to learn English. They, they are more and more of the younger members. The, for instance, the Scantaburys, the Scantaburry family, there are one member of that family. He speaks very, very good English. Um, the Motley family, um, one, one person in that family, they, they know a little English. So more members of the Barbadian community, they are now beginning to learn English again, the younger members, um, because they see it as an important part of their, uh, their heritage. Now. So they're, they're making that effort to, to learn English. But for sure, the Johnson family, uh, they have made it one of their missions, so to speak, too. They have all the members of the family speak English. We do have, just to answer the question that came through just now, the lecture will be online for viewing later. We have some contributions that came in while you were speaking, just to give you an idea of who was watching you while you were going through your lecture. We have Harlow B, who said that you were given a wonderful presentation, excellent. And we also had persons checking from as far as Canada and Bermuda tonight watching. Thank, I wish to thank them all. If they can still hear me. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, Frederick. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frederick. A good, a good friend of mine for over a decade. <laughs> a very interesting presentation. So I hope we all learned a bit more about the Barbadians and their history in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I would also like to invite the audience to come back here to the same channel next week, the same time. Uh, and the lecture next week will be, the topic is To Cuba and Back, Journeys from and to Barbados by Dr. Sharon Marshall. I'd also like to invite the audience to make contact with our curator for social history, Nat Natalie McGuire, if they would like to share their, their migration experiences and stories with us. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>